Welcome to another lecture of Invertebrate Paleontology and Paleobotany at Utah State University. This is lecture 20 in which we'll attempt to answer the question, what does the fossil record reveal about the evolution of echinoderms? Now echinoderms are the first group of invertebrates that we're examining in this class that are members of the Deuteostomia. That is that they're actually more closely related to us than any other invertebrate that we're going to look at in this class. Echinoderms include the starfish, sea cucumbers, sand dollars, and all of them are marine invertebrates living within the oceans of the world. Echinoderms exhibit a mesodermal skeleton of porous calcite that can be covered by a spiny skin. Now many exhibit a five-point symmetry or pentamere symmetry, symmetry, with other groups exhibiting a more bilateral symmetry. This unique five-point symmetry is found in many fossil groups and is, is a good way to recognize this group in the fossil record. Now, echinoderms rely on a very complex water vascular system, which is a hydraulic way of moving, and it's a very effective way of locomotion and it's very, very strong. So it's much like the hydraulic heavy equipment that's used on construction projects where fluid pressure is built up and then released to move mobile pieces. Um, so this is very different than the tendons and ligaments which run through serrated muscle tissue like in, like in your own body. And that muscle tissue can only contract or shrink so this water vascular system with this water pressure system um, is much stronger than muscle action. And this is because that fluid is pumped into different parts of the echinoderm's body. And it can be really strong when it comes to crushing strength. Now, unfortunately, with a water vascular system for locomoting, it has a significant downside. And that is, is that the water regulation must be achieved using water with a consistent amount of salinity. So if you have too much salt in the water or too little salt in the water, it can cause the water to flow through the cellular membranes. And shifts in salinity can be deadly to echinoderms since it disrupts their water vascular system. As such, echinoderms have never transitioned into fresh waters and are stellohyaline, which means that they are only found in ocean waters with a consistent salinity. The hydraulic water vascular system feeds into a large network of tube feet or podia that emerge on the outside of the skeleton through those numerous pores. These two feet move back and forth, allowing the echinoderms to crawl slowly across the ocean surface. But they're also really incredibly strong for crack cracking open shelled organisms. And many echinoderms are, are actually pretty, pretty significant predators on shelled organisms like bivalves and brachiopods. Now, because echinoderms have a calcitic skeleton, they're very common in the fossil record beginning in the Cambrian and become more diverse through time. In fact, today, echinoderms are extremely diverse with only two groups which are totally extinct. All right, so now let's go through the major groups of echinoderms. The first subphylum is the ichneozoa, which includes sea urchins and sea cucumbers. The second subphylum is the astrozoa, which are the starfish and brittle stars. The third subphylum is the cryozoa. These are the sea lilies and crinoids, a, a very common group in the fossil record. And the fourth group is the subphylum blastozoa, which includes cystoids and rominiferans, which may be a new group to you since the blastozoa all went extinct at the end of the Permian, and is the first subphylum that is totally extinct. The fifth and final group of the echinoderms is another totally extinct group, the Homeliozoa, also known as the Calcacordata. These fossils are really weird, since unlike other echinoderms, they do not have a five-point symmetry or even a bilateral symmetry. A few scientists have proposed that they are related to chordates, their vertebrates, 
But this group exhibits a skeleton composed of calcite, which is not like, like uh, other chordates. Um, and the calcite skeleton is much more similar to what we find in echinoderms, and so they are often placed within echinoderms. They're only known from the early Paleozoic, having gone extinct during the Devonian. So let's look at each one of these groups in a little bit more detail. The Echnozoa include the sea cucumbers and sand dollars, and ah, heck, let's face it, they are kind of cute and cuddly, if not a little pokey. Animals that closely resemble the common sea urchin, Echnodes, have a very extensive fossil record. Their skeletons preserve the opening for the mouth near the seafloor, surrounded by gill notches, and an anus that's above, surrounded by genital openings that release sperm or egg cells. A gut tube extends through the center of the animal. Each pore in the skeleton, called a test, is for the water-driven tube feet that extend through those pore openings and can retract when fluid is withdrawn from the feet, particularly at the bottom surface that's in contact with the ocean floor. One of the most remarkable features is the mascatory apparatus called Aristotle's lantern, which is an arrangement of five strong jaws, each with a sharp calcitic tooth. Now, this system is driven by a pyrignathic girdle that draw the teeth together to rasp or scrape at food, which is then passed down the gut tube through the body of the echinoderm. The inside of the test or skeleton is rather sparse without many organs besides the gonads, which greatly inflate during breeding to release uh, either eggs or sperm into the water for external fertilization. The matter porite serves as an opening for the water vascular system through a stone canal, which work as a canal system for the body fluids that pump down into the tube feet. Hence, locomotion is controlled by a vascular system of body fluids or water that connects with the external ocean water outside the organism. Each two feet has an ampulla. This is a sac which can be inflated and push water into the tube, making it much more rigid, while at the same time filling this tube with uh, oxygenated water that can aid the muscle tissue on either side of the two feet with oxygen. Two feet are also exhibit these suction cups which actually help the echinoderm to grip surfaces really tightly. Echnozoans cover themselves with protective spines to keep uh, predators from taking a bite and also from other animals from attaching onto their bodies. The spines can be poisonous and they can actually move in response to predators and a bit like uh, porcupine quills, they can regrow if lost in defense. One of the most bizarre echnozoans are, is the sea potatoes, echnocardium. These are creatures that live completely underground, filtering out food using their extended tube feet. They lack lanterns as adults and use their tube feet to acquire food in their burrows. Now they leave behind um, complex traces that can be identified in the fossil record since their skeletons are often found within these burrow-like structures. These guys are just weird. One of the echinozoans that's probably a little bit more familiar to you is the sand do dollar. This is the genus Melalita. Now these echinozoans crawl through the sediment filtering out food, and they're common in the littoral zones uh, on the beaches uh, along the coastlines. Now the sand dollars have five perforations called lunals. These lunals actually help sediment to pass through while food is actually drawn along grooves on the bottom of the sand dollar to focus that food into the mouth. Hence, sand dollars are adapted to a specialized food gathering adaptation in sandy sediment. Now the echnozoans originated during the Ordovician and often they're grouped into whether they are irregular, that being whether they're bilateral, 
or regular in which they exhibit that five-point symmetry. One interesting feature of the fossil record is that ichnozoans, they become really diverse as you get into the Jurassic and Cretaceous, and particularly are diverse in the Cenozoic. In fact, today they're, they're a very diverse group and doing quite well. The next subphylum are the astrozoans, the starfish and brittle star. They differ in having five arms, although some can divide these as well to have multiples of five arms with a, a very pentagonal body plan. Now each arm is flexible and can move around the ocean floor. Now astrozoans are predators of many shelled organisms that live on the sea floor. And they use their podial feet to crack open shelled organisms. These starfish can invert its stomach actually in the shell and they actually begin to digest the shelled organism from inside of it. Um, this type of feeding is very successful and anthrozoans are numerous in many locations where there's plenty of shelled organisms for food. Now they don't require large amounts of food and they have a very slow metabolism, allowing them to coexist in many marine ecosystems. Now starfish don't preserve their fossils as, as often as other invertebrate groups. And that's in part because their arms are rather brittle and they easily break apart. Now the earliest starfish or starfish are found in the Cambrian and they actually lack the five arms but still retain a pentagonal body plan instead. So for example, the, the early genus Stromatocytes um, lacks the characteristic arms but still retains a five-sided symmetry that characterizes later members of the Astrozoa. Now some beds um, could have been found that preserve a lot of starfish which have been rapidly buried and several rock layers around the world preserve wonderful starfish that we have in the fossil record. One of those that's fairly common is Devonaster from the Devonian period. The Ophophorids are the brittle stars and they have um, much more slended, flexible arms and they first appear in the fossil record during the Ordovician and are still living today. All right, now we come to the great fossilized group, the Crinozoan or the Crinoids. Now this group was once called the Palmatozoans or Stockton kinoderms, since rather than being mobile, they remain sessile on the ocean floor. Now today they include the sea lilies found in many marine environments. The anatomy of the crinoid body is divided into the brachia. These are the long plated arms that wave around gathering food. The calyx, which is where the uh, mouth and the gut are present. And then supporting the calyx is a long stalk of columnar plates made out of calcite. The stalk is akin to stacked coins and does not allow for much movement. At the base of the stalk are the roots. These roots hold fast down the crinoid to the sea floor. So crinoids are analogous to a kite that's tied down by a string on the seafloor. And the brachia, those arms, are the mobile parts of the body. Now, some crinoids may have been more mobile in the past, but were not nearly as mobile as their close relatives, the starfish, sea cucumbers, and sand dollars that can move around the ocean floor. So despite being sessile filtering animals, they're actually fairly well represented in the fossil record. All right, so there's, there's four major kinds of crinoids. The first major group is the inadunate uh, crinoids, which have a rigid calyx with brachials that are free or loosely connected to the, the radial. The inunate uh, crinoids are known from the late Ordovician to the Triassic. The next group of crinoids are the flexible crinoids, which have branches off of the brachials, giving them a wider distribution of arms. They are known from the Middle Ordovician to Late Permian, having fallen victim to the Permian-Triassic mass extinction event. The Camerate crinoids are a group which lack the radial plates and they have a rigid calyx with many thin brachials. They're the largest group of uh, with a fossil record from the Ordovician to the Permian. 
The last group are the articulate crinoids. These lived after the Permian-Triassic extinction and the group that living crinoids belong to. They have a highly reduced calyx with highly flexible arms that can move about freely. There's only about 25 genera today that are stocked, while most living crinoids are unstocked comioloids. These are what's also referred to as the feather stars, and they have roots, but they lack the columnar stalks. Living stocked crinoids exhibit two different types of feeding, either being renophilic, meaning that they seek out fast currents to filter feed, or renophobic, where they feed on detritus that's slowly falling through the gentle waters. Now these two styles of feeding can be good indicators to paleontologists about the flow of ocean currents. Hence, crinoids are really great for reconstructing water flow and currents of the ancient past. Crinoids are extremely common in the fossil record, but rarely do the calyx or brachials preserve. Most often it is the columnar plates, which when examined along the transectional surface, exhibit a five-pointed star, like here, or like over in here. These fossils also resemble stacked coins and can be found in many fossil collections. Because it is often the columnar stalks that are preserved, we don't necessarily have a complete picture of what the living crinoid might have looked like until we find that calyx or the brachials. In, however, in many limestones, the crinoid stems make up a majority of the framework of the limestone's calcium carbonate, or matrix. The next group is one of the more bizarre groups of enconoderms, the blastozoans. These only preserve the calyx portion of the animal, or theca. In life, these creatures had short stalks and tiny brachials used to filter food, much like crinoids. However, these structures lack calcite skeletons, and hence they're rarely preserved. What is preserved is the bizarrely complex theca, which served as the major portion of the body structure of these creatures. The class Blastioidea, or blastoids, lived from the Silurian to Permian, going extinct at that mass extinction at the end of the Permian, um, the Permian-Triassic mass extinction. Their calyx is common as a fossil and exhibit what are referred to as hydrospirals. These spirals likely were lined with cilia and they beat a current of water to flow past pores, allowing for both respiration and food gathering along food grooves with particles that pass down the groove, like kind of like a conveyor belt, um, and then it would open into the mouth opening near the center. They are wholly extinct and a wonderful class of animals only known from the fossil record. Now the last group is one of the most unusual groups of echinoderms, which for many are very controversially placed within the echinoderm group, the phylum. The homeozoa, or the calcochordates. Now unlike any other echinoderms, this fossil group, also called the carpoids, are asymmetrical with a complex skeletons made of calcite. Now there's some debate of what constitutes the head or the tail of these creatures, with some scientists arguing that the head is actually was dragged, um, with that front part being the tail being sort of a front leg, or whether they were sort of plunked down and filter feeding sort of creatures. Some people actually think that these guys were a bit like a primitive jawless fish and sort of um, see things that are analogous or synonymous with early chordates, uh, early jawless fish. Now, based on the asymmetrical body plans and the heavy calcite skeletons, these creatures may have not may have had very limited movement and may have acted like the blastoids for filtering food out of the sediment. They're a really peculiar group and are in need of further study to really figure out how these guys are living and behaving. Now today we have two additional invertebrate groups that are not well represented in the fossil record. They're sort of in between echinoderms and chordates, the group that we belong to. These are the hemichordates and the eucordates, the sea squirts. 
Now these two groups I discussed in my vertebrate paleontology class, and it may be that these bizarre chalcochordates or hemliozoas belong to one of these living groups and developed a calcite skeleton secondarily. All right, so now let's quickly go through the fossil record of the various echinoderms again. The crinoids originate during the late Cambrian, becoming very diverse throughout the Paleozoic, and then undergoing a mass extinction at the end of the Permian, um, right at the Permian-Triassic boundary, with a modest recovery since then. The blastozoans originate during the Cambrian, with several groups living during the early Paleozoic, with only the blastoids making it to the end of the Permian when they all went extinct at the mass extinction event. The astrozoans, the starfish, don't have a as diverse a fossil record, um, despite having a fossil record that goes all the way back to the early Ordovician or late Devonian. Um, both the astrozoids and the Ophians, these are the brittle stars, have a fossil record back to this period of time. And in all likelihood, these two groups were much more diverse in the fossil record than what we actually see uh, preserved. The ichnozoans, the sea cucumbers, sand dollars, and sea potatoes and sea urchins have a fossil record that extends back to the early Cambrian, but most of the diversity of the group appears uh, in the later part of the Mesozoic, with many of the common forms that we know today not appearing until we get into the Cenozoic, or at least into the Cretaceous. Now the last group is the Homleozoans, the Calcochordates. These weird group appears during the Cambrian and extends into the Devonian, and are represented by an unusual primitive stock of echinoderms, or related forms at least. All right, thanks for watching this lecture. If you're interested in taking a geology class at Utah State University, please click on over to the geology website, geology.usu.edu. And if you're interested in who I am and the research that I do, come stop by my website at benjaminslashberger.org. Thanks again for watching.